I personally think that porn and the availability of porn is is a real is a real detriment to the developing brain. Along those lines, I've heard you say that in order to reset the dopamine system, essentially in order to break an addictive pattern, to become unaddicted, 30 days of zero interaction with that substance, that person, etc. Right. Is that correct? Yeah. And, and 30 days is in my clinical experience, the average amount of time it takes for the brain to reset reward pathways for dopamine transmission to regenerate itself. There's also a little bit of science that suggests that that's true. Some imaging studies showing that um, our brains are still in a dopamine deficit state two weeks um, after we've been using our drug. And then a, a study by Shuckett and Brown, which took a group of um, depressed men who also were addicted to alcohol, put them in a hospital where the, they had received no treatment for depression, but they had no, no access to alcohol in that time. And after four weeks, 80% of them no longer met criteria for major depression. So again, this idea that by depriving ourselves of this high dopamine, high reward substance or behavior, we allow our brains to regenerate its own dopamine to, for the balance to really qualify. And then we're in a, a place where we can sort of enjoy other things. So that progressive narrowing of what right. brings one pleasure eventually yeah. expands. So I'd like to um, dissect out that 30 days a little more mm -hmm. finely. Um, and I also want to address how does one stop doing something for 30 days if the thing is a thought? So mm. we'll kind of I'll put that on the shelf for yeah. the moment. So days one through 10, I would imagine will be very uncomfortable. Yes. They're going to suck, right. basically, <laughs> to be quite honest, because what if the way you describe this pleasure pain balance, yeah. to my mind says that if you remove what little pleasure one is getting or a lot of pleasure from engaging in some behavior, that's gone. The pain system is really ramped up and nothing is making me feel good. I'll just use myself as an example. I'm not in recovery, but you know, that 10 days is going to be miserable. Right. Anxiety, mm -hmm. trouble sleeping, yep. um, physical agitation yes. to the point where, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, maybe impulsive, angry, should, yes. should one expect all of that? Should the family members of people expect all of that? Yeah. So what I say to patients, and it's a really important piece of this intervention, is that you will feel worse before you feel better. Um, For so, how long? Yeah. This is probably so, the first question right, they yes. ask, right? And, and I say, usually in my clinical experience, you'll feel worse for two weeks. But if you can make it through those first two weeks, the sun will start to come out in week three. And by week four, most people are feeling a whole lot better than they were before they stopped using their sub substance. So um, yeah, you have to, it's, it's a hard thing. Like you have to sign up for it. And I will say, obviously there are people with addictions that are so severe that as long as they have access to their drug or behavior, they're not able to stop themselves. And that's why we have, you know, higher levels of care sure. or residential treatment. So this is not going to be for everybody, this intervention, but it's amazing how many people with really severe addictions to things like heroin, cocaine, you know, very severe pornography addictions, I posit this, and I do it as an experiment. I said, you know what, let's try this experiment. I'm always amazed, number one, how many of them are willing, and number two, how many of them are actually able to do it. They are able to do it. And, and so that little nudge is sort of just what they need. And the carrot is, you know, there's a better life out there for you. And you'll be able to taste it in a month. You really will be able to begin to see that you can feel better and that there's another way. So the way you describe it um, seems like it's hard, mm -hmm. but it's doable for yeah. most people, not yeah. everybody. Right. And we'll return to the that category of people who can't do that on their own. Um, well, then days 21 through 30, uh, people are feeling better. The sun is starting to come out, as you mentioned, They, it, which translates in the narrative we've created here and supported by biology that... Dopamine is starting to be released in response to the taste of a really good cup of coffee. For yes, instance. exactly. But, whereas before it was only to insert, you know, addictive behavior. Right. That's right. <laughs> what, whichever. Of course, coffee to can be addictive too, but but we'll leave sure. that aside. <laughs> yeah, I feel like coffee has a kind of um, consumption limiting 
mechanism built in where at some point you just can't ingest anymore. Yeah. Um, but maybe that's wrong. Sorry to give lift to the <laughs> caffeine addicts out there <laughs> as I, cl as I clutch my, my, my mug. Um, so days 21 through 30, um, I've seen a lot of people go through addiction and addiction treatment. I've spent a lot of time in those places, actually, um, looking at it, researching. I've got friends in that community. I, I'm close with that community. And so what I'd like to talk about in this context is what sorts of things help other people that we know that are addicted? What really helps? Like not, uh, not what could help, but what really helps? And are there certain people for whom it's hopeless? I mean, I don't like to hold the conversation that way, but I wouldn't be close to the real life data if, if I didn't ask, is it, is it hopeless? Are there people who just will not be able to quit their substance use or their addictive behavior, despite, I have to assume, really wanting to? Yeah, yeah so there, there are people who will die of their disease of addiction, you know, and I think conceptualizing it as a disease is a helpful frame. There are other frames that we could use, but I do think given the brain physiologic changes that occur with sustained heavy drug use and what we know happens to the brain, it, it is really reasonable to think of it as a brain disease. And, and for me, the real window of, let's say, being able to access my compassion around people who are repeat relapsers, even when their life is so much better when they're in oh, recovery. Yeah. yeah. It's like, yeah. it's like a no brainer, right? Um, is, is to conceptualize this balance and the dopamine deficit state and a balance tilt, tilted to the side of pain. And to imagine that for some people after a month or six months, or maybe even six years, their balance is still tipped to the side of pain that on some level that balance has lost its resilience and its ability to restore homeostasis. It's almost like the hinge on that balance yes, is messed up. Exactly. And so, I mean, for, for someone who's never experienced addiction like yourself, maybe one, one way to conceptualize it is. Well, I didn't say that. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I, no, I, I was not, I, to be clear, I, I was not referring to myself, but I, 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 in this example I was given, I, if I were, I, I would, I would um, come clean. I, I would, reveal that. Um, but I, I think that especially after hearing some of your lectures and descriptions of the range of things that are addic addictive, yeah. I think, um, I, I've been fortunate. I don't have a propensity for drugs or alcohol. Right. I'm, okay. I'm lucky in that right. way right. that I, frankly, if they remove all the alcohol from the planet, I'll just be relieved because no one will offer it to me. Anymore. Right. Right. So don't send me any alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it won't go to me. Right. Um, Imagine that you had an itch somewhere on your body, okay? And it was, in, I mean, we've all had that, like, you know, whatever the source. It was super, super itchy. You can go for, uh, you know, if you really focus, you could go for a pretty good amount of time not scratching it. But the moment you stopped focusing on not scratching it, you would scratch it. And maybe you do it while you were asleep, right? That, so, and that is what happens to people with severe addiction. That balance is essentially broken. Homeostasis does not get restored despite sustained abstinence. They're living with that constant specter of that pull. It never goes away. So let me say there are lots of people with addiction for whom that does go away. And it goes away at four weeks for many of them. But in severe cases, that's always there and it's lingering. And it's the moment when they're not focusing on not using, it's like a reflex, they fall back into it. It's not purposeful. It's not because they wanna get high. It's not because they value using drugs more than they do their family. None of that, it's that really they, they, they cannot not do it when given the opportunity and that moment when they're not thinking about it. Does that make sense? That's a great description. And actually in that description, I can feel a bit of empathy because the way you describe scratching an itch in your sleep. Yeah. You know, I've, I've done that with mosquito bites and right. somebody's scratching, you know, like oh, you right. wake up scratching that, right. that, that mosquito bite. And I also have to admit that I've experienced not feeling like I want to pick up my phone because it's so rewarding, but just finding myself doing it. Yes, of course. Like I'm not yes. going to use this thing. I'm not going to use this thing. Right. And, then, and then just finding myself. Yes. Doing it. Like, what am I right. doing here? Right. Sort of the, how did I get back yes. here again? Right. And I, I know enough about brain function 